Tiararo. Okay, so the long path. Um, that name came to me um, one night when I was visited by angels, you might say, uh, in the Sunday Star Times, where I'd been reviewing a couple of books. And uh, at the time, it was a lot of um, people from the left moaning about what the people from the right had done to them. There were Employment Contracts Act and so on had been put in place. And New Zealand was pretty divided at that time. And I thought, we need a, a, uh, a national project, you know, to kind of bind people. Um, and I had talked about this with other people um, and had been inspired by a guy called Will Ball, who was, um, he, he was a very a log, log cabin kind of guy, and, and he liked long trails. I liked long trails. In my life, I'd circled the um, South Island for a year with my kids and my wife, Miriam, and, uh, and had gone on long walks, unusual walks myself, like out to the end of, can I have a uh, glass of water? Uh, from someone, <clears throat> um, out to the end of Farewell Spit, for instance, so that I could get a copy for, a, um, for an article I was doing, for a series I was doing for the listener. So I knew New Zealand pretty well. I did a book on the Springbok tour, which took me right through New Zealand, talking to all the protest groups. So I kind of knew the layout of the country. Thanks, mate. Lovely. I kind of knew a couple of things I knew that if you got out in the back country, you were always going to have a story. You, you, there were always people like when I walked um, out to Farewell Spit, the first guy I met, believe it or not, was Barry Crump. <laughs> that is true. He was fishing in one of the streams and saying to his woman, because he's terrible with women, I've got to say, but come on, Peach, you know, I've got a fish to catch. What can you do about it? And, and I walked on past and said good day. And, and then walked basically into a limitless horizon. You know, it took a long time and, and, and went to the guy who ran the uh, lighthouse out on the top. So that was the sort of work I was doing, if you like. In a sense, I was chasing stories. <clears throat> now, first up, um, this is not upside down. <laughs> There's no reason whatsoever why north is where north is and south is where the south is. It could equ equally be the other way around. So we have this great landmass down the bottom that no one particularly wants to go to and everyone aspires towards um, the couple of islands at the top. Um, I think that's right and, and it's also not the meridian at the moment is, is through, um, through England, of course, because they were pretty good on doing um, longitude and latitude. And, and the meridian here, is Kim here? Oh, Kim, it's about 140 west, isn't it? 150 west. So more or less, New Zealand there is at the centre of the world. And when you're walking New Zealand, let me say, that it becomes the centre of the world, you know. And, uh, and there's a lot to appreciate uh, about these islands, inclu including, of course, the, the Polynesian um, uh, arrival, which is an extraordinary story, coming, coming down through the islands and, and adapting and becoming, if you like, Maori um, by arriving on these shores and, and a tropical people um, are learning to live in a temperate land. So it's got great stories and, and when I did Te Araa, I was very careful to say everywhere you walk, you're walking through an ancient rocky, you're walking through someone's tribal territory and they have their stories and if you get the chance, and are lucky enough, listen to them. And again and again, when we were doing tracks, you saw how those stories reflected a landscape and, and told stories about a landscape. Like as you come up to 90 Mile Beach, where, as you know, the, um, the spirits go up that beach before diving down and, and going back to the, to the homeland. There's a point there where we put in a trail across the Herakino Forest, where the mist in the morning comes up and is funneled through a, uh, a narrow uh, passage, which means that it drops its water. So the sadness of the people, if you like, and, and this is the mist comes right up to it and just sort of flows over. And you can see why and how that's built into uh, a Maori tale, which is, has dimension because it's so close to a landscape. So, so there's people who've got a very fundamental understanding of landscape in this country. As you'll see, one of them is geologists, but Maori also have an incredible understanding of their own rohi. So, um, so here's, here is uh, my son's picture, actually, of the lighthouse. And it takes me up to, so where did this idea come from? Well, partly, as I say, I'd done some walks myself. 
uh, I talked to people. I, I learned later that, um, that um, the um, Federated Mountain Clubs, was it? No, I think it was the Alpine Club, had proposed a long trail, but it didn't go anywhere much. Um, but anyway, I had at my command a, um, a Sunday Star, and I was the book's editor at that time, and I thought, right, we'll give it a go. We'll write an inspirational piece, talking about inspiration. And, 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 and it was proposed as a national unity trail. That's what it was. And also the fact that it made so much sense to walk the length of a country, which was obviously well within anyone's grasp. It wasn't too long, it was about 3,000 k's. And there were a lot of trails already in place because we're a great walking nation. So, so, um, but um, the actual, just don't, just leave it on there. The actual inspiration finally is less that than the fact that I then designed a trail. We formed a trust and I've got to say that a lot of people should be credited for that. It was, wasn't all my work, but sorry. Um, <clears throat> so what I did was design a trail because we, Bob Harvey and I and a few other people went around all the, um, the um, councils and said where would you put a trail if there was to be a trail, where would it go so that we could figure it out. So all these people were consulted, this is a publication I did in I think 1990, 1997 and, and it was very, very primitive. I mean as I look at it it's almost a joke, like just line drawings with a dotted line across it, but it was all done with consultation as a possible route. And, and soon after, uh, Kim Olivia, who's sitting at the back, I was very careful when I started walking the route. That was my moment of illumination. I actually sat up in the bar, fists clenched like this, and said, yes, that's what I will do, having designed this trail, to popularise it, I'll walk it. It just seemed to make so much sense that I could do that. Because I was a writer, I had uh, access to newspapers, um, and Possibly I thought there might be a book in it as well. Um, so, so that's the illumination for me, is, is, is sitting up on the bath saying, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I actually suggested it to the trust, and they paid almost no, no attention. It's like the idea was so bizarre that you wouldn't just sort of go and needle people to do it, councils and so on, that you'd do it yourself. Um, but I, I called it pearls before swine at the time because I was feeling a bit but annoyed that it didn't get a really good reception. Um, and, and, and then I did it. And, and so I walked and I did a blog, and I was showing some of the others. This is, this is the sort of equipment I carried very early. <laughs> Part of the reason for the success of this trail is that it, it coincided with the digital revolution. And I was, that's true, I was right up on that digital re, uh, um, revolution. So this is a floppy disk <laughs> that goes in. And, and, and the maximum information on my photographs was about 250, 300 kilobytes. <laughs> but it was good enough to get my mates in Auckland to put up pictures of the trail I was doing. Um, and I could dial in via what was then a Bell South phone. And since then, they've gone through a couple of iterations. I think it's now Vodafone, but Bell South at the start got a sponsored phone and would go up on a mountaintop, having written my story on a computer that I carried, and, and fire it down. So, so I got a very big readership on that blog. And that, to me, was when the idea started to get traction. Uh, and perhaps particularly when I was talking to Kim Hill on top of, um, uh, what's, what's the mountain just? Mount Manaya. Mount Manaya. <laughs> Mount Manaya, thank you. <laughs> I was talking to, um, to, to her and live on national radio. Uh, and I actually had two phones, so if one cut out, I could do the other one. And I, there was a woman at the top, I'd said, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll um, give your dog some water when we get to the top. And, uh, and, and she got to the top, and I was talking to Kim, and she said, you promised my dogs some water. Like, you're not talking on national radio, you should be dealing with me. And she went crazy. I mean, she only had one hand uh, to start with, and she started banging the table with a stick, and four-letter words went streaming out across national radio, and my readership went zip like that. <laughs> it really did. I suddenly got, you know, thousands. But <clears throat> right, so what I'm going to do, so that walk was pretty successful, um, and when I got to the end, it was only the North Island I had designed, right? So, but I talked to all the mayors all the way through, and it was early 
sort of regional trust stuff and also testing the roots, talking to the farmers, going up and seeing them, banging the table, having a cup of tea and so on. And because I wasn't Doc and because I wasn't the council, people listened. So, um, <laughs> well, it's true. You know, they liked, they just liked someone coming through who, who wasn't an official. And uh, so, there we go. Um, 90 Mile Beach, and then, so part of the design for the, um, for the trail was if you stay on, on the west coast for how long? Two days, three days, three days, four days, uh, with blisters, you know, then you want to get off it fundamentally. <laughs> and, and so you go across the forest and that's the first Harakino. And I'll just tell you that the, these, this trail is not as the trail now is because we've been kicked out of some of these forests because of um, Kauri dieback. So it is right. But initially this was it, and we put a trail through there uh, that's Herakino, that is um, Raitia, right, right then Omahuta, um, then Pukati with lots and lots of carrion, which is where Matt was walking up the that's Waipapa, right, wasn't it? Pukati. Yeah. Pukati, I call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and then down to Keri Keri, and so part of it was we do, the, the Americans do different trails. They do historic, they do wilderness trails, they do urban trails. We do all, all of them at once, so you had to go to Kirikiri, you had to go to Waitangi, and then you went up through the, for, for, that, for that reason, they were historic places, you know, uh, and then through the um, Russell State Forest, and then down um, Fongarai is up there somewhere, and then down the eastern coast, so you've done the, you've done the western coast, you've done, you know, cross country there, um, with some very interesting geology in there, and then finally, okay, so, <coughs> So you come down here, and this would be um, Mount Tamahanga, which again we crossed because it was the highest, um, highest mountain on this whole section. Really, it was only sort of 450 meters or something, but but it, it's big for what for what it is. And again, we're very careful to sort of um, to knit in Maori history. This is this is called uh, um, a, a, a walk that that was. There were, there were Maori in here from the Waikato Wars who opposed the British, basically, so, so we told that story in signage and things. And then down through here and Moyers Hill, again, you're starting to sight Auckland there. Then down the river and basically you're on the east coast then uh, getting into urban walks through Auckland, out through Puanui Stream. Unfortunately now that's the Hunuas, um, and we and we just can't go through there anymore, right, Kim? We don't, do we? It'll come open soon. It'll come open, yeah. okay. And then you're down um, uh, to the, that's the Mangatafari stream down there, I think. Um, yep, yeah. okay, so. And then through, oh, that's Hamilton, Parongia. When you're in Parongia, you can, you can see the central plateau, so you can kind of see what's in front of you. And the reason I tipped the, um, tipped the world up the wrong way is that honestly when you are walking this is the main way although we have um, northbound people who, who do walk the other way but most people start in the north and, and when you do that the moment you lay down your maps you're always facing south right so so south orientation is very much a part of Te Araroa, it seems to me so um, Parongia and you, you can see the central plateau so let's go to the central plateau um, so there we hook up with um, the Waikato River, basically the Karimata range there, which is pretty nice range, and, and the big uh, Tainui uh, Urupa in there, uh, and there's Hamilton, Barongia, as I said, and then down through uh, Waitomo, Tikuiti, and up the, what do we say, Matt? Mangokiwa. 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 Yep. Uh, through to Puriora, Hohangaroa range, where you, you, I don't know if you still do, but we went up a mountain there and you could see Lake Taupo and you see some very interesting geology. It's a great tumbled part of New Zealand, which is under immense pressures from subduction, basically, and you can kind of see it in the landscape. It's kind of, it just looks weird. <laughs> it really does. It's like an animal thing, you know. Um, 
wow, it sh hills shouldn't look like that, you know. A lot of it, I mean, that's just been blown right out. You know, it blew out something like 35 square kilometres of, uh, cubic kilometres of uh, material when, when Taupo went up, and it, and it wasn't so long ago. That's a subduction effect. Anyway, so down how hung the rowers, and then, 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 Oh, I've lost it. So can we go to the can we go to the next slide? Oh yeah. So there to the central plateau, right? So that's the Tongariro walk, which you walk the opposite way from how it's usually walked, and we do have permission to do that. And this is a wonderful landscape, of course, with the Ruapehu just there. And then down across country, you're starting to get uh, into Papa, which is very soft. So when I was coming through here, honestly, it was nightmarish to be honest because even a little stream is like a knife through butter, you know, the walls are up like that. If you try climbing them, the vegetation just comes away in your hand. You've got to remember that I was doing stuff which was what people said could be done, but there was no trail, right? So, so, so it was quite hard on occasions. <coughs> Down the Whanganui um, to Whanganui City itself, and this is beautiful, beautiful, of course. Um, again, you know, soft papa, so that you've seen the banks of the Wanganui. Um, they tower above you as, as you come through, and it's a pretty special place. It's also now got a personality, everyone knows that. The big thing about New Zealand is legal status for, um, for um, a natural phenomena, you know, like rivers and, uh, and areas of bush and things. Um, okay, so through to um, the Manawatu, and uh, you get into the, low, the Tararua lowlands here. I got into very bad trouble in those lowlands, believe it or not, not even in the serious stuff, but I tried to find a trail which was on the maps and it just turned out not to be there. So I was stranded in there and I was talking to my wife saying, don't ring search and rescue because all my, all my mates in the media are gonna love the fact that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm a, five minutes. Five minutes? <laughs> and you know, I was literally praying, please, I wasn't praying for the search and rescue, I was saying, please don't. And I've got a photograph of myself coming out of that particular stressful situation, and honestly, I look haunted. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Okay, so, yep. So here's the um, Tararua's Mount Crawford, is up there, probably that one there. You get up to about 1,500 metres here. And it's pretty consistent, 1,500 metres too. So it's, you know, it can be dangerous. Um, so far, there have been no serious, serious incidents in there. Um, and it's a beautiful walk because you're basically ridge running. You can see these are compression ridges from the seduction which is out there. So all this is squeezed up high, but it all runs um, as with the Pacific Crest Trail. <laughs> you know, it's a single formation, right, that you're moving along. And the same with the Appalachian Trail, of course. But, so that's our, that's our equivalent there, and you get more of it in the South Island. So through here, and, and this is an old map, so the Escarpment Trail now probably runs along there. That'd be right, Kim? Yeah. Yeah, just inland of there. The Escarpment Trail is one of the classic trails of New Zealand now. We put that in uh, and tried for years and years to do it, to get the funding and so on, through to Wellington Island Bay, and... Uh, you touch the water at that point. Right, so we're going to really skip through the South Island quickly, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, Queen Charlotte, which I'm told has just been closed, but there we go. And the Richmond Range, uh, I really, it's not like the Tararuas. It's been pulled sideways. There's the upper part of the Alpine Fault. It's a Marlborough Fault, but it's part of the Alpine Fault. So it's really twisted these mountains around. So the moment you get very high uh, elevation, you plunge down again. It's very can be very disheartening because every time you climb up, it's shingle. So two steps forward, and about two steps back. You know, so you, it's hard to climb a mountain and that stuff. Uh, okay, and we're just going to do a couple of dips, quick dips. So this is this is the kind of map we, you can see the huts. You can see that you know there's a quite an easy day's tramp between each of these huts, and so although it's a remote area. You're very well um, protected, really. And you come up um, to the uh, lower Wairoa and, and you come up here and we go through. And the highlight for me of the entire trail is coming up in the next slide, which is 
the Red Hills. You see it through the trees and it's like a sunrise. It's like, how did that get there? And it's completely foreign rock. It comes up out of the sea. It's to do with ancient subduction, which if I had time I'd talk about later, but, <laughs> but I won't. Okay, so, so down through there. So Nardid, and I think, Eleanor, I think that your favourite bit was the Nelson Lakes Park, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, which is beautiful, um, really beautiful. And here you're at Lake Constance, which I think, Matt, you mentioned. Um, yeah, and, you, and you come through here, and, 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 and that's why I passed there. And then on you go, and basically you're on the uh, St. James Walkway, because a lot of Tiara is existing walkways. And then you come up, and there's a pass there, which is of the Alps. You can see the Alps. There's the Alpine Fault running down. And there is the pass. Uh, it's called Harper's Pass. I've just read a book. I know Stacey's going to agree with this. It should be called Noti Haranui, which is the, <laughs> which is the Maori name for it, because Harper was guided across. And not only that, Harper was a bush, bishop's son. You know, the Maori knew about it for like generations. It was an escape route for the Kaiapoi Pa if Tarelt Raha was around, and you know they really knew about it. Um, so why should it be called Harper, Harper's Pass? So we're going to call it. Kim, take no day, eh? because Kim does have many. <laughs> Noti, Noti, <laughs> Haranui. Okay, and then down the Taramakau, and then basically you're off and across the uh, Waimakariri. I think we cross the Rakaia on a road bridge, although lots of people cross it higher up, but, but that's what we do. And then the Rangatata, I certainly cross that, uh, and it's not too formidable. And then across the Two Thumbs Range, and then you're into the the lakes, the big glacial lakes, you know, that have all come off the mountains over years. Yep, <coughs> there you go past the lakes, that's Pukeki, I think, and that's um, Ohau, Lake Hawea, of course, Lake Wanaka. We go past all of these, and the views from up there, for instance, you know, a thousand metres up sort of thing, are just fantastic. I mean, just, just a vast landscape, vast, with big glacial outwash giving you huge... Um, kind of planes, you know. And, and then, uh, this is the famous Shania Twain track. She gave us some of the worst territory on her considerable estate to cross. Anyway, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah, There's certainly an easier way to do it. And I, and I hate to say it, but when I walked it, I did walk up the valley. I had permission, you see. But later on, when it, you know, hard dealing, they said, no, you're not going to walk up the valley because that's where we do our, uh, our uh, musters and things. So, and, and Kim tells me that we're probably going to get up the side now of Wakatipu, so you'll just go across there in some sort of water transport. And then you're on the Greenstone, then on the uh, Mavora Lakes. Yep. <coughs> Coming down, there's the Greenstone, tipping into the Mavora Lake Trail. Beautiful huts. Doc said to me, you must put that in, Jeff. No one's using that trail. It runs north-south. It's ideal. Uh, and so we just did. Bang. And, you know, that's a big section of the trail mm -hmm. completed. And then we had to really work on this one because this is all, um, this is the Takatimus and it's all to do with pastoral leases and so on. All this area is to do with pastoral leases, so a lot of negotiation there. And this, I'm getting to the end. This is the, this is the Longwoods. And the Longwoods, when I was up at 800 metres with a geologist, he said, Jeff, you know you're on the biggest mountain range in New Zealand, the highest mountain range. I said, no, 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 that's wrong. We're at 800 metres and I can tell you that, you know, parts of Tiaroa go close to 2,000, let alone the mountains. And he said, no, 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 these are the biggest. Now this is um, a, a remnant of Gondwana land, and this was the great range, just like the Andes, that was, that was inwards of a subduction zone, right? So the subduction zone is pushing up a volcanic landscape out here. And this is um, part of the, uh, what was um, New, Z New Zealand uh, Cordillera, I think he called it. So the Longwoods is a beautiful smooth range, but it's just very, very old. Um, and it's basically the stumps of some very high mountains. And then Riverton, Colic Bay, Riverton, through to Invercargill, Tim's country. I think. Through the block. I'm not sure he knows, you know. Um, <laughs> Through to Bluff. I'm a great friend of Tim's, by the way. Um, yeah, through to Bluff. And at Bluff, here we go. 
Hey! <laughs> this is Nikki and Cookie. They were early. She was, you know, she was afraid of all sorts of things, vertigo and this and that and the other. She became a very staunch hiker just by doing Tiara Roa. This guy is a, was a uh, designer. I think he did the Skype logo and things like that. These guys are professionals. These guys walk trails all over the world. They've got trail names. That's Tuk, which means big toe in, um, in um, Dutch. And this is Yeti, A.L. Sforts, who is a, um, basically a nuclear physicist now. He had, uh, he's got a very good job in America. So. so there we go. And finally, and this is going to be quick, but this, this is what intrigues me about um, Tiara and I'm sure part of the determination I had to see it through uh, was all this geological landscape is so different. We've been on the side, on the western side of, um, of Gondwana, and so we've had all these bits of land coming in on that ancient continent glued together. And so we have a huge variety, as is well known, of landscapes because all this underlying rock is kind of different. So the Red Hills is this bit here, which is a bit of um, um, ocean rock that's been pushed into the land that never got subducted and then got raised up by the Alpine Fault, a very, very unusual um, piece of land. There you see the Alpine Fault, that's granite, that's grey wacky. This is all grey wacky from offshore in Guana. Gondwana. This is the uh, Australian plate here, pushing together. That's sliding sideways, it's going up, pushing up the fault. Um, this is all ancient Gondwana, that's um, ancient Gondwana, that's ancient Gondwana, that's ancient Gondwana. Um, so, so is Rakiura. Um, so there we go, that's what I find fascinating about the place and you will know a lot about it if, if you do it. Um, really you will, like Elena says, you want to know what the bird calls are, like my woman who's walked a lot of uh, this with me, Miriam, knows bird calls like, she can just say. Uh, I've heard amazing bird calls, even the kokako, believe it or not, uh, which is the most beautiful sound in the bush coming through mist, I've got to say, you'll get experiences which uh, will chill you to the bone in some sense because I remember when I, you know, when I, okay. No, you're a, you're a policeman, aren't you? You've got me on ten now. I said, how do you respond to this? You respond to it by falling on your knees. You know, that's what I felt. It's like that um, ancient, that it's like a worship. Um, yeah, just just an amazing sound. So um, those are the experiences you get. You hear the wind coming across the forest towards you like an ocean wave sweeping across your your um, your sleeping place, be it a tent or a hut. And when that happened to me, I was approaching bluff, and I thought, I don't want this to end. You get into a rhythm with it, and it's a very, very uh, satisfying sort of existence. Took who you see standing there like this, the Dutch guy who's a professional walker, turned to me soon after that picture was taken and said, Jeff, we're just civilians now. They had been pretty special and treated as special by a lot of people because they brought in stories from a long distance away, you know, and people wanted to invite them into their houses to talk to their kids and it's just like a breath coming through of something which I think we've lost, you know. Um, and that is a kind of nomadic wandering where you become superstitious. Do you become superstitious on a Pacific Crest Trail? I, I did. I had a lucky hanky tied to one of my sticks. Um, and so, so, there we go. Do it. <laughs>